James, thanks for having us along today. It's an absolute pleasure. Sweetheart, you gave us a really precious collection that we've dubbed the Betty and Tommy collection. Right. For the Queer the Peer exhibition at Brighton Museum and Art Gallery. Yeah. Before we get on to that, I'm interested in finding out how you came across it. I've... Uh... I, well, my, I'm an antique dealer, essentially. Were you always? Uh, no, I, was a, I had a fashion business in the, in the 1960s. I'm very old. And um, I was at the London College of Fashion in, uh, in the very first year they opened, in 1963 to 6, I was there. Amazing. It was a wonderful time to be doing fashion in London, the 1960s. It was sort of swinging London and all that. And in true swinging London spirit, I went into business with somebody and we had um, a, a boutique started off as one boutique and it ended up as three boutiques, one off Carnaby Street, one in the city and one in uh, Notting Hill, just off Portobello Road, where we made frocks and uh, carried on and uh, became really quite successful mm. uh, but I had a terrible falling out with her and went my own way after a few years and um, and didn't your brother sell vacuums or something and yes my brother so I was in so I, I was in Portobello Road essentially mm. but I'd been there for some time I mean I've got lots of family in that area which used to be a uh, very kind of poor rundown before Hugh Grant made it famous. It was very, it was very you know, we, I mean, we all lived there as art students because it was cheap. Imagine living in Notting Hill Gate because it was so cheap. Uh, but you did, and that's what it was the whole, you know, the, the market was an amazing ambience. It was an extraordinary mix of all sorts of cultures and... Uh, and it, of course, it was very, very gay, uh, it's, uh, and that's where, it's where the gay, where gay lib started in this country, um, on Colville Terrace around Betty Bourne and the and the the pink, yeah, um, right, uh, and all that lot. And I knew I lived next door to Betty, and although I wasn't running up and down the road just as Karma Miranda the way Betty was, I was in that whole. A swim of things. So did that teach? So that's where you picked up the skills pick, yeah, to be a buyer so, and so. So I had the we, we would. I was making frocks and doing all that, and we started making uh, old frocks out of fabrics and stuff that I'd bought on Portobello Road. And when I gave up um, actually making dresses for people. I started buying and selling just the fabrics. By then, I'd picked up a, you know, I mean, I, I had a background anyway of textiles, and mm. I sort of picked up a sort of knowledge of antique textiles. And so, I, I, I in 1972, 73, uh, I started doing that full time. I started dealing in textiles and stuff. Where that's where I met my friend Sheila Cook, who was just starting out, whose name I just gave you, mm. um, and. Mm. Uh, from there I went from just dealing in textiles and stuff I mean I, I went into dealing everything I mean my brother had a, a, a second hand vacuum cleaning shop off Portobello Road in the 1950s and <laughs> beginning of the 60s and it was my Saturday job was help, helping him in his shop in the mornings and in the afternoons I'd go down Portobello Road with my you know two pounds or whatever he'd, I'd earned and uh, look at all sorts of bits of stuff and pick up by stuff. I remember the first thing I ever bought was a, a silver handled mother of pearl paper knife, mm -hmm. um, which was one and sixpence, which was about, about seven and a half P. Uh, and that was the first thing. And of course, there were loads of it was a Portobello Road antiques, it was all very, very gay. And I was just wanted to be part of that world, you know, the way you do when you're a young teen, teeny boy, teeny bopper. Did you, did you, when you moved to Brighton though, because you lived in Brighton for I did. 20 we, odd years? Yeah, I did. When I met my other half in, uh, in, in 1989, we lived in London for a while in his flat and uh, then we wanted to buy a house. We wanted to settle down and, you know. <laughs> I love it. It's very romantic. I didn't, I didn't want to have cats or, or start knitting, but, you know, we wanted a Victorian house. 
and we couldn't get one in London, even in 1991. It was even living in sort of, you know, undiscovered bits of London, like bits of, the, bits of the East End. They were already sort of much too expensive. Yeah. So we bought a big Victor well, big-ish Victorian house in Brighton where we lived for 22 years. Um, and in Brighton, I just transferred my buying and selling business down to Brighton. And I, I got to know people and I got to know people that cleared houses and stalled out at the Sunday boot fair and um, uh, started dealing in a sort of bigger way, actually, by the time I came down to Brighton. And that is so. And, and through those contacts, I started to get a lot of stuff from deceased estates and through right. solicitors and so on and so forth. There's something extraordinary about going into a home of uh, somebody that's been dead a long time, mm. you know, and, and very often there are probate problems and whatever. So you can sometimes go into a house and it's been empty, you know, and and, and if the probate has proved difficult to settle, sometimes it could be years. So, you know, I've been into houses that have been empty for 10 years that are completely, the you know, same, frozen uh, in and, time. and it's frozen in time. Mm. Um, so and, that's what, was uh, that what this, this place? That's a, yeah, that's pretty much what, that's Tommy and Betty. I was, my, my friend called me up and he said, I've got instructions to clear a bungalow uh, that's been empty for quite a while, a couple of years or something, I think. Um, and it's uh, in, near you, do you want to come along? So it was just down the road in Goring. And so I went along and it was a, a sweet little 1930s bungalow with a very sort of sadly run to seed garden. Obviously they'd cared for the garden and it was all overgrown, but you could see it had, had been something wonderful. And it was a it was a bungalow, it's bungalow, bungalow land out there, but it was a real, a real, Home, and the, you know the decayed and sort of obviously very sad remains of what had been someone's home. I mean, there was a there was a there was a conserv a conservatory out the back. There was a sort of a, a built-on conservatory thing, and it was full. I mean, full of dead plants in pots, shelves and shelves and shelves of plants, all dead. So it would it have been like very, a nursery it, that very, they... Yeah, and it had so obviously... Let's start, let's been start at the beginning. We think that Myra Violet Thomas, who's, Myra, whose yeah. nickname was Tommy. That She was, that was Tommy. Yeah. She, we think her dates are 1917 to 1996. Right. And okay. then we've got Betty Thaxley. Yeah. And she was born in Brighton. We're not sure what date she was born. Yeah. But she died in 2017. Oh right, okay. So, so it had been empty for a couple of years. Yeah, definitely been empty. Yeah, yeah. for three odd years. But she'd lived there alone since um, Tommy had died. So you go into the house. Yeah. It's empty. The plants have all died, but there's evidence the of a very full died, life lived together then, because of yeah. just the number of and now, plants. And what there, generally right? happens in these places that when you get something like uh, um, that kind of clearance, it's a clearance. In other words. Um, the house has got to be emptied of all this stuff before it can be sold. Uh, and uh, it's generally speaking, all that stuff is just chucked out. But hang on a minute. This means that you're going into a house where they've got no living relatives who are interested in saving... Yes, not always. Sometimes they've got relatives and they're not interested. They don't want to know. Mm. I mean, and in this instance, that and in this we instance, don't, we don't I, don't, know. I don't know what don't the exact know. circumstances were in this instance. In, in this instance, um, I, but um, I know that uh, um, it had been empty for a couple of years, and she'd lived there um, since nineteen ninety something by herself. Mm, yeah, but, right. Because because but all, Tommy but, died in 1996. Right, that's right. What, but all, mm. it, but it was full of Tommy's stuff, and I mean, wow. it was full of Tommy's wow. family stuff. I mean, and and Tommy, they came from um, Tommy's family were middle class, you know, reasonably well off middle class South London. Uh, 
And so there was all her, f- the photographs of her as a young girl mm. in the 1920s. Mm. You know, they were all, you know, that was all uh, um, signs of a rather, you know, well-off kind of middle-class life. And and they worked, they, they served in the military together. So there was this rather run-down bungalow with loads of stuff in it, and some of the, you know, none of which was much, you know, much uh, use, really not sort of, boot fair stuff and you know lots of this stuff goes off to charity shops and whatever but upstairs it was in the bungalow had a a roof space a sort of live it livable roof space yep. so you could go up and you were you know under the eaves and up under the eaves there was there was every, all manner of crap I mean there was loads and loads of stuff that you don't want to know about um you know, which is sort of rotted and, uh, yeah. but there, under an, underneath a, uh, um, underneath a, a, a blanket, I pulled the blanket away and there were all those albums piled up underneath the blanket and that which was, I think the most recent things in those albums were probably from the 1960s. So we've got photos of them so there are photographs in caravanning. From the 1960s back essentially the army connection which carried on beyond just service i think they were in some kind of uh cadet training whatever there was some kind of brighton yep and there and and you can see photos of them working as telephonists and yeah. you can see uh, yes she, she worked, was a lifesaver that's right she worked as yeah she was a lifesaver that's right yep tommy was the lifesaver and all that all that so it was a complete a complete life really and it would have been it would have been chucked out and this is it would essentially have been i mean if somebody else had gone on oh god no one wants all these who wants these photographs of all these you know blah 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 would have been just chucked out and so. what it what made you want to keep them what was it about was it what made me want to keep them to, to well, save them you know i i've uh, i'm i've been collecting gay and lesbian and queer ephemera for about 30 years 40 years uh, I've written a couple of books about it. I've been based on my collection. I mean, the the bulk of my uh, postcard collection um, is in the Welcome Library um, with my name on it. You mm-hmm. can actually Google me, James Gardner Collection at the Welcome Library, uh, and they, with 13 images, 13, sorry, 1,300 images on postcard are essentially of... Uh, cr- uh, cross-dressing and uh, gay life I mean gay gay life it, you know and and the actual social history of gay life is my major collecting point so I mean, do not... you think if this hadn't been found by someone in our big queer family that it would have been overlooked I think probably yeah I mean there's a big market now in old photographs I mean people buy them and everyone's into researching their family history and you know so there's a big so so old photograph I mean if you go to any flea market now you'll find loads of old photographs and yeah but whatever. I mean this but house was left empty there's there's no one who's no. claimed all their life that they've spent no. together and they've clearly no. spent 50 years together they spent 50 they've years served together in the war together they've lived their life together yeah. they bought a bungalow they've set up house yeah. and she stayed there 10 years she, after her partner's well, died 20 years 20 years exactly yeah so and it's, and i don't and i think that the important thing is that it's the uh, it's the ordinariness of their life that makes it and it's always made me much more interested quite the qu- ordinary queer lives are, have are, are not documented they're never they're never documented you know it's not like you know it's not oscar wilde about you know everyone knows about every single day of oscar wilde's life you know they know when he wiped his bum and when he blew his nose and what you know month in 1896 he shagged lord alfred douglas do you know what i mean but it's not it's not that i mean he's you know you've got the opposite ends of the scale you've got the most famous homosexual of all time and then you've got the other 999 million percent who I've just live in that, bungalows outside live, Worthing. Living bungalows outside Worthing. Yeah, absolutely. So, actually, so to find that in so much detail, I mean, I'd actually found something very similar 
1992, I published a book called A Class Apart, which is based on a photo archive that I, uh, again, same thing, came from a house clearance. But in, in this house clearance was a, a man, a, 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 an elderly man had died in a bungalow in uh, the Midlands. Um, and um, auctioners were called in to clear the house with strict instructions from his great nieces who were the, 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 the everything, burn everything, get rid of And he actually, he knew of my, he'd kn known through my own publishing that I was interested in gay imagery of bygone periods. Mm. And he went into this bungalow, say into a bungalow and he found 18,000 photographs um, which all taken by this guy um, uh, who was doc essentially documenting gay life from the 19 eight, 1918 there's photographs he took in World War one of men with their arms around each other yeah amazing so so that I mean that so that was a very very ordinary life yeah. and that I mean that it was a, it made a great book and um uh, it went into several editions and was in print for 15 years. Gaze the Word told me it's their best-selling picture book of all time. <laughs> now I'm fortunately out of print, but um, but it was the same kind of deal. Yeah. You know, on a much oh, bigger scale a, I think than there's this. There's a book in this. I think it's extraordinary. Oh, I think it would be a great little yeah. book, wouldn't it? I just, not what, not a, not a long, you know. I mean, you haven't got 18,000 images. Yeah. But I just think incredible. as an exercise in. In, in queer in queer well. lives and da -da, you've got the imagery and you've got all the stuff too. Yeah. I mean, I don't know to what extent um, people might feel that this is all very intrusive to do this with. That was you know, my one last question. It was well, my one last question for yeah. you. So we've been doing some work with some young people at Photo Works, yeah. and, it's, and it's come up there whether they feel comfortable showing this as part of the exhibition, which we have done, right. because I believe that it gives us a place in time, just like you say, as ordinary queer people. Yeah. Right? So that's where I'm coming from. And that they yeah. kept evidence of their life together happily. I mean, they're drinking in caravans. They're yeah. out with their mates. They're sure. in women's only spaces. Well, but it's my one last question to you to finish up with is, are we okay doing this? And when are we allowed are, to celebrate our queer history and not worry about it? Are we okay from what point of view? Legally, are we okay using morally? these materials in an exhibition when we didn't ask them first because we found it later that we're putting them on show? Because And I'm putting them well, on show Well, they're dead. They should give a fuck. They're dead, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Why are they going to be bothered? I'm, and I I'm don't, very you grateful. Know, I think that, and I think it's, uh, I think it's really important. It's what, you know, that people need examples. They need to know that that is possible. And that's the wonderful advantage that young queers of whatever persuasion these days have got so many examples there, so many possibilities, you know, there it is, you know, they can do that. And, and I think it's great. And I think that, uh, uh, I'm not. I, I, I can't think about what they might have thought. And obviously, people of that generation were very much in the closet. You didn't talk about it. 